Hey, welcome to Compass. Our mission is navigating people to God. We are one church in a thousand locations right now. If you're new with us today, uh, my name is Drew, and I'm one of the pastors here at Compass. Uh, we are so glad that you're here with us today. We're honored that you would watch. I just want you to know we're in this thing together, praying for you, miss you guys, excited to share with you today. Turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter four. We'll be there in a moment. I love the story about the jogger who was out jogging one night and he decided to take a path through a cemetery. It was a shortcut to where he was headed and he was doing fine and then boom, he fell right in a freshly dug hole that was used, gonna be used the next day for a burial and he tried jumping and climbing and everything he could, he just couldn't get out of it. He settled in for the night and about an hour later, another jogger came along and fell in the same hole. The second jogger gathered himself and started trying to figure out a way to get out. And then he felt a hand on his shoulder and a voice say, it's no use, you can't get out. But he did. He discovered a power that he never knew he had. And today, I hope you discover a power you never knew you had. I wanna to talk to you about the power of prayer. We are in week two of our series, Anxious for Nothing, and we're taking four weeks to deal extensively with this subject, the subject of anxiety. It's become epidemic in our culture, especially right now. And the potential effects of anxiety are absolutely devastating. Max Lucado wrote a book called Anxious for Nothing, which was obviously the inspiration for this series. There's a moment in his book where he writes this. He says, anxiety will steal your breath away. It'll take your sleep. It leads to stiff necks, clenched jaws, and overactive bowels. Anxiety can twist us into emotional pretzels. It can make our eyes twitch, our blood pressure rise, our armpits sweat. One doctor said, if you wanna really see the consequences of anxiety, just read about half the ailments in the medical textbook today. The problem with anxiety is absolutely real. And many of us are working through it right now. So let's talk some more about how to overcome anxiety. Because remember, we talked about this last week, that the presence of anxiety is unavoidable, but the prison of anxiety is absolutely optional. And that's what we're learning in this series. We all feel anxious from time to time. To be anxious, honestly, is to be human. You know, I've told you before, I've struggled with anxiety many times in my life. And what I'm learning is how to step outside the prison of anxiety day after day and week after week. And Paul is giving us the answer in Philippians 4, the blueprint for moving from anxiety to peace, from anxiety to calm. And I wanna read those five verses that we're studying again because I hope at the end of the four weeks we'll have them memorized. The Apostle Paul from the prison cell, about to be executed, a man who has every right to be anxious, he says this, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I love that. I hope you'll commit that to memory by the end of this month. Now, if you remember, we said last week that peace is found living inside the boundaries of God's goodness and that God is always in control. And we said that if you believe that God is good, but you don't believe he's in control, you'll always try to take control yourself. If you believe God is in control, but not good, you'll tend to doubt your creator a little bit. But when you position yourself inside the boundaries of his goodness and his kindness and his control, you remember that God is near and that God is with you. And once you remember those things, you'll remember also who God is and that he is always with you, and that you're ready to take the next step in dealing with anxiety. And here's our focus today, just one verse, verse six. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, did you hear that? You know what that word every means? That word every means literally each, every, any, and all. <laughs> so you think that might cover anything that you might be anxious about? So in every situation, here's your next step, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. That's amazing. That's what we're gonna talk about today. Paul tells us so clearly that when you're anxious, 
go to God and ask for help through prayer. Okay, show of hands on something. How many of you have had that annoying red check engine light come on in your car? Raise your hand. I know I can't see your hand, but just wanted to see if you would do it. And, and I bet some of you did do it. When the check engine light comes on, it causes a little anxiety, doesn't it? Because you don't know if this is going to be a little problem with your car or a big problem. This is why some people don't always pay attention to it. You're just too anxious to know. I don't want to know. You don't want to know. It's kind of like when you're sick, but you don't want to go to the doctor because you don't want to, want to know what's wrong with you. But that light is a signal indicating that you should take it to someone who knows how to address the situation, someone that can help. Listen, anxiety is like a red check engine light alerting you that something is not right in your life. It's a signal. It's an indicator that it would be wise to go to the manufacturer, in this case, your creator. You go to the one who made you. In other words, if it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. You see, peace is found in the path paved with prayer. So let me ask you, when you feel anxious, is God the first person that you turn to for help? Or is it someone else? Or is it something else? It could be anything, a habit, a hurt, an addiction, maybe Netflix, something to get your mind off of it. For many of us, if we're honest, and this is just so true of me many times in my life, prayer is often our last option instead of our first line of defense. And if you're frustrated with prayer, if it just hasn't helped you, if you've never if you've ever given up on prayer, stay with me today because embedded in this single verse is a way to pray specifically for anxiety that many of us, I fear, have missed. I'm asking you, is it possible? Could it be that there's a way to pray that has greater power over anxiety than you realize? So let's look deeper at this verse in Philippians 4. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, and again, notice those three words, by prayer, petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Now, what's so interesting about those three words, prayer, petition, and request, is all of them are synonyms of prayer. I want you to take a look at this bullseye just for a moment. The first word that Paul uses refers to our general approach to prayer. I mean, it's like, I know I can, you can help me, God. I know I should turn to prayer. I'm going to pray. Even if it's just a generic prayer, I'm going to throw it up there. Well, the second word means you're petitioning God. You're going a little deeper. God, I need your help. Please help me. But listen, we're told to even go deeper, to present our request to God. And this word means something definite and something specific. That's the bullseye. Now, notice the progression when it comes to praying through anxiety, because the bullseye when praying for anxiety is to get ultra specific and you state exactly what you're anxious about and exactly what help that you need for God. You ask God for help, and this is hard to do because we know that anxiety is fear about the future. The what if, what if, what if, what if, the what ifs and the, and the hypotheticals and the theoreticals of life, and sometimes you're up in the middle of the night planning your whole life and thinking and worrying about this stuff, and it takes work to dig down deep into your heart and discover what exactly am I anxious about? What can I be specific about with God? That's the bullseye. And if you were evaluating your prayer life, where do most of us live? We live out on the edge, just that kind of that generic prayer. We throw it up there. God, help me be with my kids, be, be with my church, protect us from the enemy. But until we get specific, it's gonna be hard for God to deal with anxiety in your life. For example, how many of you have a child and your child has come up to you at some time or another and, and they're just hysterical and they're crying, help me, daddy, help me, daddy, help me, daddy. mommy, help me, help me, help me, help me. And you're like, whoa, 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 calm down, slow down. With little kids, we'll even say this, use your words, use your words. Because unless they get specific, we don't really know how to really help them. We need our kids to get specific with us. In a marriage relationship, sometimes you just know by looking in the face of your spouse or by their body language that they're upset about something. I've been married to my wife 33 years. I, I kind of know what her body language is telling me. And you, you don't know what you did wrong all the time. So you ask, what's wrong? And, and, and what do they say more often than, 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 than not? Nothing, nothing's wrong, nothing's wrong. Guys, I just want to give you some, mental, some marital advice here. 
you newly married guys, pay attention to this. Nothing never means nothing. Nothing always means something. And it's probably something you did, so just go with that premise. Also, don't ever say to your wife, use your words. Don't, don't say that, because that's a really bad idea. I've tried that. She'll use words, all right. She'll use words. You see, you can't really help someone with what's bothering with them until they get specific with you. So let me ask you, do you ever get ultra specific in your prayer life with God? Do you state exactly what you're anxious about? Because that's what he wants. That's the bullseye. And I know it's not easy, primarily because sometimes we feel like the things that make us anxious will seem a little too small and a little too silly to God. The problem (laughs) is this. There's nothing too small for God. If you think something is too small in God's eyes, it's probably an indicator that you also think something is too big in God's eyes. And that's a problem, friend. You have a heavenly father who wants to hear your prayers. He wants to hear from you. And no matter what kind of earthly father you had or didn't have, he's a good, good father. He loves you. He longs to give you grace. And we're told to get specific with God. But here's what I think many of us have concluded. The Bible says that God already knows what I need before I even ask it. So why would I need to get specific with God? I'll be honest with you. It's a great question. But here's a thought for you. Maybe getting specific with God isn't for God's benefit, but it is for your benefit. Okay? I want to show you a very bizarre and interesting passage in Mark chapter 10. I love the Bible. I love the New Testament. I love the Gospels. And in Mark 10, there's this blind guy, uh, blind Bartimaeus, who is who's sitting in the on the roadside in Jericho, and he's begging. Can you imagine being blind in the first century? Can you imagine the anxiety Uh, when you were blind? it, It was thought by many people in the culture that that you did something in your past and so God was cursing you or somebody was cursing you. And so there, wasn't, there weren't a lot of work options. You didn't know where your next meal was coming from. You didn't know where you were gonna sleep that night. So he's just sitting there and he's begging and he hears that this rabbi, Jesus, is coming through. And he begins to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. <clears throat> Mark chapter 10, verse 47. He just says, help me, help me, Jesus, help me. Have, have mercy on me. And we're told that people around him rebuked him and told him, you you be quiet, shh. Bartimaeus, be quiet. But he shouts all the more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. And he says it over and over again. This is where many of us live in our prayer life. God help me, God help me, God help me. God have mercy on me, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. And Jesus calls him over because Jesus always hears our prayers. And Bartimaeus throws his coat aside and he jumps to his feet and he says, Jesus, is that you? You know, he can't see. Jesus, is that you? And watch what Jesus asked him. Mark chapter 10, verse 51. He says, Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? I can just see the disciples going, "Uh, Jesus, did you notice that uh, everyone knows this? This dude is blind. He's totally blind. So we have an idea of what he wants. Listen, Jesus knew that Bartimaeus was blind. Again, Whenever Jesus asks a question in scripture, it's hardly ever for his benefit. It's almost always for the person that he's talking to. Jesus already knows. He's asking Bartimaeus to get specific. Tell me, Bartimaeus, what do you need? I want you to articulate it. And so this blind man just says, Mark chapter 10, Rabbi, I want to see. I want to see. I've never been able to see. I just want to see. And Jesus says, ah, okay, that's something I can work with. So Bartimaeus got specific and Jesus heals this blind man on the spot. And don't miss this. Why would he ask the blind man what he needed when he already knew? Because when Jesus asks you to get specific, it's for your benefit, not just for his. So here's the big idea, okay? Don't, if you've not grasped anything yet, get this. The more you pray specifically, the more God can ease your anxiety personally. Let me tell you a a few of the reasons why I believe that. First of all, specific prayer helps you get to the root issue every time. We have to get specific when we pray. It gets to the root of what's causing your anxiety. Hey God, I'm just anxious about my marriage. Uh, Could you fix my marriage? It's not going well. Okay, God cares about that, but let's get specific. God, my wife and I, we just aren't on the same page. 
Uh, we're not talking about anything important. We're not connecting. Ever since my son went away to college, we just haven't been on the same page. And I fear that we have nothing in common anymore. I fear we're drifting apart. Now, that's a prayer that God can deal with, okay? You deal with that in your heart and your soul, and you work through it. Or, hey, God, I'm, I'm anxious about some body image issues. I, I find myself comparing myself to other people. Can you help me? Absolutely, he can. But what are you really anxious about? You've got to dig deep. Well, at the root of it, I, I guess, Lord, that I just wonder if anybody's ever going to be able to love me the way that I look. And if, if I do ever find a spouse, is that spouse ever going to be able to love me if my body looks like it does right now? And, and I just really am insecure about it. Can you help me? Absolutely, he can help you because you've got to the root issue of the matter. Now, listen to me, and someone needs to hear this today. When you dig, and it's uncomfortable to dig at the root issues in our heart, when you dig, what some of you are going to find is that you have some unresolved guilt and shame in your past that you've never really allowed God to deal with. Listen to me. We all have it. We all have some guilt and shame. I have it and you have it. But we don't have to stay there. Our past may impact who we are, but it must never limit who we can become. And you've got to get to the root issue in order to overcome anxiety. And specific prayer is the first step. Okay, here's number two. If you're writing notes, write this down. I've learned over and over again in my own life, specific prayer for anxiety almost always involves other people in the answer. We're better together, right? We're learning that. We're learning right now in this era. We need community. Now, Philippians is not the only letter that Paul wrote from this prison cell in Rome. He also wrote a letter to his friend Timothy, his young friend that he was mentoring. And he says to Timothy from the anxiety of prison, hey, get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. Why did Paul say this? Because Mark was an encouragement to him. He was somebody he could pray with, somebody he could talk to. I want to tell you, two of the most powerful words in a church community like ours, like Compass, Simply the words, me too. Some of you have come through some really dark seasons in your life that you're not proud of. And what you didn't need in a season like that, when you were succumbing to hurts and habits and, and your addictions, when you were, I don't know, overeating, when you were grieving, when you were in the valley of the shadow of death, here's what you didn't need. You didn't need somebody to lecture you and say, well, you should do this or you should do that. No, no. You needed somebody to say, me too. I've been there. I'm with you in this. I'm walking through this with you. When you were powerless and someone, God forbid, used their strength and their position and their authority to abuse you, you just needed someone to say, me too. I've been through that too. When you're anxious, you can sometimes be a jerk to your spouse. You need someone to say, me too. We've got to work on that together. When you were stressed and you yelled at your kids on the way to church, <laughs> Yeah, me too. We got to stop doing that. We got to work on that. When someone cut you off in traffic this week and you wanted to road rage and cuss somebody out, <laughs> me too. But I have this compass sticker on my back window, so I couldn't. But I wanted to, right? Friends, don't blow by this. Learn from the Apostle Paul. A specific prayer for anxiety almost always involves other people in the answer because everyone needs prayer. And specific prayer is such a great way to connect with others. People who don't know Jesus might not be ready to go to church, but most of them are not offended if you say, hey, is there anything I can be praying about for you? What a great question to ask anyone in the entire world right now. A spiritual question that won't bring judgment or ridicule, but it shows that you care. Very seldom is anyone going to be offended by a prayer. Plato said this. <laughs> That's right, Plato, 400 BC. Be kind. Everyone you meet is fighting a battle. Not much has changed the last 2,500 years. We're all struggling with something. Specific prayer might be the answer. Here's one more thing. Specific prayer can lead you to a specific passage of Scripture. This is huge. One of the most powerful ways to pray is to pray Scripture over your life. Sometimes when I get discouraged, I'll just pray the Psalms. It's amazing how much it lifts me up. When you're full of anxiety, one of the most powerful things you can do is to find a promise in Scripture that fits your problem and what you're anxious about. And then you make a prayer out of it. And some of you are like, Drew, that sounds great, but 
how in the world am I gonna find a, a scripture to fit the anxiety of my life? I don't really know the Bible well enough to find that. Well, first of all, you need to go to Rooted, right? But we'll talk about that later. But here's what you do, and I'm totally serious. Go to Google, you type in exactly what you're anxious about, and then you add these two words, Bible verse. And I promise you that Google will come through for you. And there'll be Bible verses all over the place that God will use to speak into your life. I'll try to give you an example or two. This can be so powerful. Maybe if you're really afraid about something right now, just Google. Google uh, fear Bible verse. And Google might lead you to Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And you just make that your prayer. God, I'm in this dark valley. I, I don't want to be afraid. I know you're in control. I need you to be with me right now. You just pray that prayer. Or maybe you've made so many mistakes, you just wonder if God can use your life, if he has a purpose for your life. And Google might lead you to one of my favorite verses, Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And then what do you do? You take that verse and you make it your prayer. God, I'm going to be confident in spite of everything that I've done, in spite of the fact that I've messed up, that you're going to good, do a good work in my life and, and that you're going to complete me in Christ Jesus today. And you make that your prayer. I love that. Or maybe you wonder, is my anxiety ever going to leave me? Am I ever really going to conquer this? Am I just going to carry this around? Am I going to stay in that prison? And Google might lead you to 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And you just make that your prayer. God, I'm casting all my burdens in your direction. I know you care for me. I know you're not going to give up on me. I know you love me. And you make that your prayer. Uh, one of my very favorite scriptures in all the Bible has been a prayer of mine for a long time. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says this. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I love that. I love it that Paul calls it a throne of grace. It reminds me of two amazing truths, that God is in control, that he's on the throne, and that he's in charge, and that he sits on a throne of grace, that he is a God who loves me and longs to give me grace, that nothing is too small for him, that nothing is too silly for him, that nothing is too insignificant for him, that he is approachable, that he loves me, that he wants to give me mercy. So do it. Let's ask him. Let's seek him. Let's find him. Let's approach the throne of grace and let's get specific. Let's hit the bullseye along the way. Let me ask you something. Have you given up on using prayer as a tool for anxiety? Well, I guess there's nothing left that I can do but pray. Is that your go-to line? Is that your last line of defense? Because it should be your first course of action. Maybe you've given up let me tell you, it's time to start praying specifically because the more you pray specifically, the more God can ease your anxiety personally. I once watched a documentary on Mother Teresa and I always admired her so much and she always seemed to say the right thing. And in this documentary, a reporter asked her why she had made the decision to minister to the poor and the troubled and the sick. Why did you make that your life passion? And she said, you never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. These people, Jesus is all they have right now. I love that. It reminds me of my own dependence on God for every part of who I am. And it's why prayer and petition to Jesus is so very important to our future. Because in many ways during this pandemic, we have learned that Jesus is all we really need. I always chuckle to myself when I hear people say, praying for you in these uncertain times, as if all of time preceding this virus was certain. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Everyday life on planet Earth is uncertain. We are never guaranteed tomorrow or even tonight. Life is so uncertain, which is why we need to pray. And the path to peace is paved with prayer. I want to pray a prayer of peace over you today a prayer that God will do something different, something fresh, something new in your life. Would you pray with me? Would you close your eyes and bow your heads? God, we present our request to you today and with faith we believe that we don't have to live in the prison of anxiety. 
We boldly and supernaturally approach your throne of grace. We ask you, God of peace, to rule in our hearts in this moment and in the weeks and months ahead. And I just would ask that you would keep your eyes closed and your head bowed. And I just want to ask you, if you're out there right now and you're watching and you've never made Jesus your Lord and Savior, if you want the kind of peace that we're talking about today, if you want to be free from this anxiety, I want to ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads. Christians, you be praying for them. Would you pray this prayer? Jesus, I need you. Come into my heart today. Take this burden of anxiety in my life. I accept you to be my personal Lord and Savior. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, I want you to tell Pastor Chris today or someone in the chat section that you prayed that prayer. We would love to continue the conversation with you and talk to you about next steps. I hope you're enjoying this series, Anxious for Nothing. Next week, part three is my favorite message of the whole series. Please don't miss it. Love you guys, praying for you guys. Take care, we'll see you soon.